So, let us do a recap of the last lecture and this is the slide which kind of summarizes what we did in the last lecture. This is two dimensional NMR and this is based on the concept of segmentation of the time axis and the time axis is separated into four periods like this. So, the preparation period and then you have the evolution period T1 and the mixing period then you have the detection period T2. These are time variables which means you do lots of experiments, a series of experiments varying the values of T1 and the data is collected as a function of time during the detection period T2. Therefore, you generate a two dimensional data matrix and of course, in every case the preparation and the mixing they remain the same, they remain the same. So, you systematically increment the value of T1 and collect an FID. So, if you have to do say signal averaging, then you have to do for the each value of the T1. So, you will have to start with the 0 value of T1, then you have 1 delta T1, then you have 2 delta T1, 3 delta T1 and so on and so forth. You collect a large number of FIDs. So, you generate a two dimensional uh, matrix of FIDs. So, all there will be so many FIDs as many increments you use in this evolution period. And then we said that you have to do a Fourier transformation that you first do a Fourier transformation along the F2 dimension, then you do a Fourier transformation along the F1 dimension that means the against the T1 period the first uh, this will be for the T2 time uh, variable other one will be for the T1 variable and this generates a two dimensional uh, spectrum which is indicated like this. So, that is if you have a frequency here a particular frequency which is indicated by this particular line here. So, during the evolution period then the during the mixing part of this uh, magnetization of the spin is uh, retained and part of the thing is transferred to another spin L. Suppose I take with the K spin then I transfer part of it to the L spin and that appears as a cross peak here on this. And the whatever remains on the K itself which evolves during the period T2 appears as a peak here and this is the called the diagonal peak and this is the cross peak. Similarly, if I have a frequency omega L during the period T1 evolving and then during the mixing period for the same interaction there will be transferred to the K spin and therefore, here you will have part of the magnetization on the K spin and part will be on the L spin. So, they evolve with the respective frequencies. So, the data you collect here will have two frequencies. So, it generates after a two dimensional Fourier transformation a diagonal peak here and a cross peak here. So, it, it produces a symmetrical spectrum like this. Okay. So, now let us go into more details with regard to the mathematical operations which is important to understand the phenomena in greater detail because there is going to be more and more uh, experiments coming in and this, this will depend upon what sort of uh, preparations you do and what sort of mixings you do and depending upon you to generate uh, various kinds of uh, data bodies and it is important to create a formalism or a general formal structure to analyze these kind of spectra. So, let us first therefore look at two dimensional Fourier transformation. A two dimensional frequency spectrum which will represent by the frequencies F1 and F2 the two axes are represented as F1 F2 will be generated from a two dimensional time domain data set which is represented as S T1 and T2 by two dimensional Fourier transformation. So, this is mathematically represented in this manner S F1 F2 is equal to the Fourier transform of the two dimensional data body S T1 T2 and now these two Fourier transformations are separately written here this uh, one along the uh, T1 axis other one along the T2 axis. So, this is the these are operators for the two and here we have the time domain data S T1 T2. Uh, F1 and F2 represent Fourier transformation operators along the T1 and T2 dimensions respectively these have to be carried out independently. Okay, let us look at that in somewhat more detail. So, here you have the formula for this Fourier transformations. S F1 F2 is this is the same as before and this uh, the two Fourier transformations are indicated here once more here. 
Now let us write this explicitly f1 is this integral minus infinity to infinity dt1 e to the minus i omega 1 t1 and f2 is this integral minus infinity to infinity dt2 e to the minus i omega 2 t2. This omega 1 and omega 2 are the Fourier transformation frequency variables along the t1 and the t2 dimension and S T1 T2 appears here of course at the end as the two dimensional data body. So these Fourier transformations integrals are calculated independently one after the other. Conversely, so if you want to get the time domain data here it is an inverse Fourier transform of the uh, frequency domain spectrum S F1 F2. This is the inverse Fourier transform F inverse and this uh, again can be split into the two individual inverse Fourier transforms f1 minus 1 f2 minus 1 of s f1 f2. So put it in more explicit uh, terms you have this is explicitly given as 1 by 4 pi square integral minus infinity to infinity df1 now uh, this is the variable of the frequency spectrum and this is the Fourier transformation spectrum what in the when you do the forward Fourier transformation you have it as minus i omega 1. So here for the inverse Fourier transform you will have it as i omega 1 t1. So similarly here minus infinity to infinity df2 exponential i omega 2 t2 and here it is minus i omega 2 t2 on the time domain for forward Fourier transformation and here for the inverse transform you will have i omega 2 t2 and here you have the frequency domain spectrum s f1 f2. Okay. Now generally the time domain function is a complex function. Let me try and explain this to you. Uh, we have seen when we do data collection in the one dimensional experiment you have this uh, frequency axis and if the magnetization is here and if this is processing along this during the detection period you have the detection here and here possible. So this component of the magnetization as it comes here it generates a cosine omega kt and this component produces the sine part and we write it as i sin omega k t for the k spin. If it is going with the frequency omega k then we will have the f i d which you are going to collect by collecting both these components we will have these two terms cosine omega k t and plus i sin omega k t and the, to represent their orthogonal say this i is coming here. So therefore this is a complex signal. You do the same thing for uh, T1 and T2 axis and therefore here in general this S T1 T2 will be a complex function and we will write that as a real part and an imaginary part. So here you see this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. So in a two dimensional data matrix as well we will have a real part and also an imaginary part we will write in this two dimensional data body. Explicitly this is the real part SR T1 T2 plus I SI T1 T2 this is the imaginary part. So when you do a two dimensional Fourier transformation naturally you will also get a complex uh, spectrum which will have a real part and also an imaginary part. So S F1 F2 will be written as SR F1 F2 plus I SI F1 F2 this is with regard to the spectrum. Although I have used the same symbol here but notice this actually will be the discriminating factor. The uh, variables here are f1, f2, variables here are t1, t2 therefore this is simply to indicate as, as the signal what you are going to measure in the two cases. Now this Fourier transformation in general can be written as a sum of two transformations this we have already seen. This is Fc minus IFS a general Fourier transformation is written as a sum of these two what are these? This is the cosine Fourier transform and this is the sine Fourier transform right. So when we write the general variable uh, as e to the minus i omega 1 t1 so this is you can write it as cosine omega 1 t1 minus i sine omega 1 t1. Therefore this actually will have two components dt1 cosine omega 1 t1 and the second term will be so dt1 sin omega 1 t1 and that will have an i factor. So therefore the first term will be the 
cosine will be the cosine transform and the second one will be the uh, sine transform. Therefore, we write here f the general Fourier transformation as f c minus i f s. Okay. Now, we apply this uh, formulation to both the domains. So, this is for the first domain which is the t1 domain and this is for the t2 domain time axis. So, f c 1 minus i f s 1 and this is f c 2 minus i f s 2 and here we explicitly written this time domain signal as SR T1 T2 plus I SI T1 T2. So, now what you do? You do these operations explicitly independently all of them. So, you will have this operating FC2 operating on this and on this likewise FS2 operating on this and on this. Similarly, after that you get this FC1 operating on the result of those two and and likewise fs1 operating on the results of those two. Therefore, you can combine these two together say you can fc1, fc2, sr, t1, t2 okay. and likewise you can say I multiply these and this I get plus i square that is minus fs1, fs2, sr, t1, t2 and similarly you operate on the other side. So, fc1, fc2 operating on i, si, t1, t2. So, and then you have fc1 minus i fs2. So, individually you can calculate all of those. So, as a result of this what you get? You get uh, the real terms we do not have the i part and the imaginary per terms as the frequency domain spectrum which, which has the i part. So, which are the ones which give the i part? Uh, the, the real part fcc this, this and and this. This gives me a real part plus and multiplication of this, this and this. So, minus FSS SR T1 T2, this gives the real part. Now, FCS I T1 T2 that is, so you have this one, this one and this one. So, you get this minus I square, right? Minus I square gives you plus 1. So, therefore, this, this and this also will be real. Therefore, you have FCS. SI T1 T2 because it operates on SI T1 T2. Likewise, you also have FSC that is this one, this one and this one. Okay. So, we, because you must have two, one I from here and one I from here. So, this one, this one and this one. So, FSC SI T1 T2 all of these will be real and likewise if you see FCC operating on I. So, this, this and this will give you FCC SI T1 T2 because this will have the I component here and therefore, this is imaginary and similarly minus FSS that is this product and product with this. So, this gives you plus I square then you have another I here and therefore, you will get minus FSS SI T1 T2 and then you will have uh, F minus F C S minus F C S that is this one and this one operating on this F C S F C 1 minus I F S 2 operating on S R T 1 T 2 that gives you this term. So, this is again imaginary because of this I and then you have minus F S C and S R T 1 T 2 S C that means it is this one this one operating on SRT1 T2 this will have the minus i component this will get the minus sign. So, FSC SRT1 T2. Okay. Now, let us write these terms explicitly FCC SRT1 T2 is this integral minus infinity to infinity. So, you have the cosine Fourier transform therefore, this is dt1 cosine omega 1 T1 and this along the second dimension also it is a cosine Fourier transform therefore, you have minus infinity to infinity dt2 cosine omega 2 t2 and this your time domain function sr t1 t2. And what about this fss, fss that is this one here. So, it is sine transform along both the dimensions therefore, here you have dt1 sin omega 1 t1 and dt2 sin omega 2 t2 sr t1 t2. So, this are this is also a real number. So, likewise now if I to fcs 
So, along the T1 dimension I have the cosine Fourier transform therefore this is dt1 cosine omega 1 t1 along the t2 dimension I have the sine Fourier transform therefore I have here dt2 sine omega 2 t2 sr t1 t2 and similarly this fsc is along the t1 dimension I have sine transform and that is this one here dt1 sine omega 1 t1 along the t2 dimension I have the cosine transform therefore I have here dt2 cosine omega 2 t2 sr t1 t2. So, I have written here all those explicitly for the real part of the, the frequency domain spectrum. Now you can do similar equations for the imaginary part of the Fourier transformations si t1 t2 as well. All of these you remember notice here are sr t1 t2 and so similarly you can write for the si t1 t2 what terms that will come. Now, the FID is of course the transformations actually go from minus infinity to infinity, but for time less than 0 there is no signal therefore this FID will have 0 signal therefore for T1, T2 less than 0 there is no signal transformations will have to be considered only for the range 0 less than T less than infinity. So that is so much the formalism for the Fourier transformation those are the definitions. Okay. Now let us look at at the end of this what sort of spectra we will get, what sort of a peak shapes we will have, what does the Fourier transformation yield. So you, you recall the Fourier transformations in the normal case one dimensional Fourier transformations we will have uh, real and imaginary components and we will have different peak shapes. The peak shapes will be absorptive peak shapes and dispersive peak shapes. So here also we can expect a similar thing. So what we will do is let us explicitly consider two particular transitions. Let us say we have an energy level diagram something like this various energy levels at various places and let us represent these uh, energy levels with particular symbols. Let us call this energy level as T and this energy level as U and let us call this energy level as R and this energy level as S. Yes. There will be a transition from here to here and this will be represented as it by Tu and there can be a transition from here to here this will be represented as Rs transition. This is a Tu transition and this is an Rs transition. Now we assume that uh, during the evolution period there is a particular transition there is a particular frequency Tu and this Tu we write it as omega Tu and this transition will therefore write it as omega rs okay so let us go back and see what uh, we are going to get considering a particular component coordinate between levels r and s okay now r and s is taken in t2 domain and t2 in the t1 domain the time domain signal for this pair will be srs tu t1 t2 and we have here well in fact tu is omega tu is taken as in the t1 dimension and omega rs is taken as t2 dimension. Complex signal is written as e to the minus i omega tu t1. Now this coherence, this is the coherence right, this is the coherence in the transverse plane, this coherence decays and this decays with the transverse relaxation rates and these are the transverse relaxation rates. The lambda tu is the transverse relaxation rate for the, tra the transition tu and lambda rs is the transverse relaxation rate for the uh, RS transition and so therefore this decay has to be included in the FID. This is the free induction decay along the T1 in, in along the T1 axis and this is the free induction decay along the T2 axis. Okay. Now let us define the this particular term uh, uh, ZRSTU is equal to SRSTU 0. So this is the amplitude. This is the amplitude for the after the Fourier transformation what we get for the uh, frequency domain spectrum this is the amplitude and the frequency domain spectrum is now written as SRSTU omega 1 omega 2 and uh, this is given by this uh, expression and that actually comes from this particular integral as I can show you here. This is 0 to infinity I have here e to the minus i omega t u t 1 
into e to the minus lambda t u t 1 this is the decay part and then you have e to the minus i omega 1 t 1 dt 1. So, pulling the terms so this will be equal to 0 to infinity here e to the minus i omega t u plus omega 1 t 1 into e to the minus lambda t u t 1 d t 1. So, put it this together once more. So, this is equal to 0 to infinity. I have here e to the minus inside bracket I have i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u the whole thing is multiplied by t 1 and integral d t 1. So, this is equal to I will write here this one is next step this is equal to uh, e to the minus i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u t 1 divided by minus i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u and this whole thing is from 0 to infinity. So, if you want to expand this and this will be given as the first first at the value of the infinity and then minus the value at 0. So, this is explicitly writing it as e to the minus i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u t 1 divided by minus i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u at t 1 is equal to infinity minus the same expression <coughs> uh, e to the minus i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u divided by minus i omega t u plus omega 1 plus lambda t u and this is at t 1 is equal to 0. At t 1 is equal to infinity the term goes to 0 because e to the minus lambda t u t 1 is equal to 0. At t 1 is equal to 0 the numerator is is equal to is equal to 1. Therefore, therefore we get finally the integral integral is equal to 0 minus minus 1 upon i 
omega T u plus omega 1 plus lambda T u. <coughs> then therefore, this is equal to 1 upon I omega T u plus omega 1 plus lambda T u. So, this is the calculation of the integral and subsequently of course, you can multiply this by lambda T u minus I omega T u plus omega 1 to the numerator as well as the uh, denominator then you get rid of the i part and then you will get expression in two different uh, terms as indicated here. So, we have here this is the first term this is the Fourier transformation with respect to uh, the T1 axis and this is the Fourier transformation with respect to the T2 axis. Okay. Now, here we have written here what is delta omega T u? I remember I wrote here explicitly omega 1 plus omega T u and delta omega R s is omega 2 plus omega R s. Delta omega R s is this omega 2 plus omega R s and this relaxation factor comes in here as well. And this is the amplitude, this is the amplitude after the Fourier transformation. So, Z R s T u is now what you do? You convert this into uh, you multiply the denominator by uh, and the numerators by this lambda T u uh, uh, minus i omega T u. Uh, so, therefore, you get here omega delta omega T u square plus lambda T u square and you get two terms lambda T u divided by this minus i omega T u divided by this delta omega T u square plus lambda T u square. Similarly, for the um, this term which is along the T2 axis you get lambda R s divided by omega delta omega R s square plus lambda R s square minus I omega I delta omega R s divided by delta omega R s square plus lambda R s square. Now, we recall from the discussions in the very first chapter that what are these line shapes. So, here you are plotting as a function of the frequency. If you plot this as a function of frequency, what frequency? Omega T u, these are the various frequencies which may be present in your spectrum and this omega 1 and omega 2 are the running variables of the Fourier transformation. right? So, for the various frequencies that are present, so what do you get the as a, a, a line shape in your spectrum? So, if you plot this, if you plot this as a function of frequency, then you will see that this will actually generate an absorptive line shape and this is the same as what we had done earlier in the case of one dimensional Fourier transformation and, and this will generate a dispersive line shape because this is an i omega delta T u omega delta T u square plus de lambda T u square. And similarly, this is a absorptive and dispersive components along the f1 axis and now this is on the f2 axis you have uh, absorptive component and the dispersive component present. No, remember here we just put here as omega 1 or omega 2 that is because we use the running variables omega 1 and omega 2, but in the frequency domain spectrum finally, we may represent this as f 1 f 2 as well there is a running variable along the uh, frequency axis. Okay. So, now therefore, now we return use these symbols f 1 and f 2 here. So, I have here uh, absorptive spectrum for the transition A T u for the coherence and a dispersive uh, line shape for the along the f1 axis for the same uh, coherence tu and here i have ars f2 and minus idrs f2 this is the absorptive component and this is the dispersive component after the fourier transformation now if i multiply this if you multiply this so what do i get atu ars and this will be real right because there is no i component there and similarly, this product, these two terms product, this will give me a real component again. This is plus i square, then therefore, therefore it is minus d t u d r s. And the cross terms, this is minus i d t u and a r s, this produces an imaginary term and this one against this will also produce an imaginary term. Therefore, this 
satisfies what we said earlier that the frequency domain spectrum also has real part and an imaginary part. Now ATU ARS this one will now if you plot this it will have absorptive line shape along both dimensions and this will have a dispersive line shape along both dimensions. Now if you look at these two terms this will have mixed line shapes. The first term here DTU ARS this produces a dispersive line shape along F1 and an absorptive line shape along F2 and this term ATU DRS again produces a mixed phase and this is dispersive along F2 and absorptive along F1. Okay. So now if you look at the real overall real part this has both the absorptive and dispersive components. So in principle if you collect the entire real part it will also have mixed line shapes. So therefore now we have to choose what we want to have. So how, how do we choose it and what are the criteria how do we choose it. Okay. Now this is clear when you make a plot of these various line shapes. So this is a, a line shape which is absorptive along both the dimensions this is the first term that ATU ARS and here you have the dispersive line shape along the both the dimensions that is the DTU and DRS that is this one here. So if you this both contribute to the real part of the spectrum if you collected both of these then of course you will have a mixture of the both the line shapes and uh, so it will be a mixed phase. Now here it is a, a more complicated situation that you have absorptive line shape along one axis and the dispersive line shape along the other axis. Now therefore now if I were to take a individually these line shapes and take their cross sections heights at various places here cross section and plot the contours this peak will look like this and if we were to take the cross sections here at various levels we will have a peak shape which is like this. It has the 0 at the center and it has lobes going out like this that is the characteristic of the dispersive line shapes right along both axes the dispersive line shape is of this type it has a 0 at the center and it has lobes on both the uh, other sides. And therefore this has a very broad signal and it is uh, and the plus plus and minus indicate the positive and the negative signals. And here it is a combination of the two and you have minus minus here and this is a very ugly ugly line shape. So typically we would like to have this. So typically we would like to collect only the absorptive absorptive component of the line shape so that you have a much better spectrum much better resolution in your two dimensional spectra. So therefore we have to play around with the data acquisition and Fourier transformations so that in the end we generate a spectrum of this type which has absorptive line shapes along both the dimensions F1 and F2. Okay. So we will stop here and uh, quick recap that we have done today is the two dimensional Fourier transformation the theory of that one and we have seen how it generates various kinds of uh, line shapes and how to optimize what we should do and what we need is an absorptive line shape along both dimensions and we have to optimize our experiments so that we collect data in the appropriate manner and do a processing also in that manner uh, so that we generate absorptive line shapes along both of the frequency axis. So we stop here and continue with the same in the future classes.